And if you feel at war with the body that you live in, if you feel like you're housed in a body that wasn't made for the person you are, being disconnected can be a coping mechanism, right? It's not necessarily the solution, but it's something that temporarily your brain does to give you a little bit of relief from feeling the sting of that, that war that's going on in your body all the time. Hey everybody, before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 210. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people just like you. And today I have a question and answer episode. Uh, You may have noticed last week we did not have an episode that was intentional. Um, If you're listening to this live, we are in the midst of the protests that have been um, sparked by recent police violence toward black people. And I wanted to leave some space for more important voices last week. And even this week, I felt a little hesitant to put something out. But I think that, um, you know, the work continues. This isn't one week of put up a black square on your Instagram and leave it at that. Um, It's something that is ever present. And I want to unequivocally say that black lives matter, that all lives can't matter until black lives matter. And that us white folk have a whole lot of work to do and some really difficult truths to confront about whiteness, about white supremacy, about systemic racism, about the impact of intersectionality on all these things. And if any of those terms don't make sense to you, Google exists, please use it. Use that as a starting point. Um, I wanted to suggest a couple black creators that have been really informative for me recently. And I think that they would be great people for you to check out as well. Um, One of which is Sonia Renee Taylor. So S-O-N-Y-A Renee Taylor on Instagram. They are an author, poet, and they share some really, really well said and difficult to confront truths about all of this. And especially if you are a white person, a privileged person like me, um, I think this is a really important person to try to listen to without being defensive and try to integrate what they're talking about. So that's one. The other is uh, a book, um, How to Be Less Stupid About Race by Dr. Crystal Fleming. Um, Dr. Fleming is also a really, really great person to follow on Twitter. I, I think that she uses always the self, I think is her, her at, but if you just search Crystal Fleming, you'll be able to find her. Um, really again, another great person that is not going to sugarcoat anything for you. And the, how to be less stupid about race book is, is a great one. I'm working my way through it. I'm about halfway through right now. And it's something that I don't want to say it doesn't hold your hand because it explains things in a really good, clear way, but it's provocative and challenging. And I think that's the sort of thing that we need to be listening to right now. So that's all I'm going to say about that for the moment. It will not be the last thing that I say about it uh, because this is not a new issue. This is not an issue that's suddenly going to be absolved in, you know, (laughs) one week here, two weeks here. Um, So as I said, the work continues and I think it's really important for all of us to recognize that and try to do our part in being anti-racist and being the best support that we can be for people who are experiencing um, and have experienced their entire lives the impact of things like systemic racism. So that's what I'm going to say for now. Um, In terms of this episode, what we have is a question and answer. I'm taking two questions this time. That's uh, been basically my my comfort level with these episodes during the pandemic. I'm really hoping that I don't get interrupted again. I've been interrupted several times so far trying to record this uh, by kids. (laughs) Those damn kids, man. Have kids, they said. It'd be fun, they said. 
<sighs> anyway, let's go ahead and get into the episode. I, I got some really good questions here. So here is question one. All right, so question one reads, Hello, Mr. Duff. I'm writing to you because I'm concerned about a friend and I do not know what to do. My friend has no motivation to do anything. He has not been in class for a long time. He does not do homework. And he told me he needs motivation to do everything, everyday things like brushing teeth. He also has very low self-esteem and self-respect. When he tells me this, I ask him if he ever thought about getting therapy. And he says his family can't really afford it and that if someone got it, it should be his brother. I know his brother, and it's clear to me that both really need it, especially the friend I'm talking to you about. I thought about maybe asking the teacher to specifically help him out or something like that, but I don't know if I'm overreacting or if he is actually becoming depressed. It's also clear that nothing I say he will believe, and seeing him so down makes me worried. Sometimes when he tells me something, I tell him he sounds depressed. He says he isn't depressed, he's anxious. Even if you don't answer this email on the podcast, I'd be really, I would really appreciate it if you could email me back, uh, blah, 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 blah. If it helps for you to know, he's 15 and a boy. Um, to that last point, I typically don't email people back. I just throw these into uh, my collection of, of my, my pool of questions to pull from for each episode. I can't email everybody back individually. I'm sorry about that. But here's your question, and I'm going to answer it here. So the context here is that this is a 15-year-old uh, boy that we're talking about. Tough situation. So thank you for the really good question, and thank you for caring about this. I know that I have a lot of young listeners out there. Um, so I just want to say to all of you who are on the younger end of the spectrum that I appreciate your attention and I appreciate your trust in me and I want you to know that I take you seriously. Um, so with that said, let's answer the broad question here first. Um, I can't diagnose your friend without being able to meet and work with him individually, but overall it does sound like he could definitely be, um, somebody who's suffering from depression, um, whether that's, you know, a major depressive episode or, and, you know, a depressive disorder, some other type of mood disorder, who knows, but the symptoms you're talking about and the things that you've mentioned do sound very reminiscent of depression. You also though have to realize that your role as a friend, your place is not to diagnose him or to decide what to do with him either. That's, that's not your role. Your role here is as someone who cares and someone who wants to help in any way that you can. Uh, you may not be able to fix the situation. You likely will not be able to fix the situation and you have to understand that. It's tough. It's always tough to see somebody that you care about suffering. Um, and you can do what you can. We'll talk about some things that you can do, but you may not be able to fix this for him. Okay. Let's talk about some of the symptoms. Some of the things I'm hearing here that um, suggest what your friend's experiencing might be depression. So you talked about low motivation. Um, this is a, a big symptom of depression. And a lot of times people who are um, more, you know, on the masculine side of things, regardless of, you know, what their identified gender is, if they are kind of more stereotypically masculine, they might be less apt to have really, really strong bouts of like, you know, crying and hopelessness and things like that. But they might have other symptoms such as really low motivation. Um, and so when you talked about this friend not even brushing his teeth or feeling like he has to use a lot of effort to brush his teeth, that's very telling to me. I, I've known many depressed people personally, professionally, and when you're feeling depressed, sometimes the simplest task like um, throwing something away rather than just leaving it balled up on the, on the kitchen table or brushing your teeth or um, going back in the house to grab a sweater when you forgot one, something like that. These small tasks seem insurmountable. They seem so difficult to get started with, or it would just take that last shred of your effort that you don't have anymore. So, you know, very simple things like that can take a ton of energy. And so that definitely, you know, strikes me as, as one of the things that your friend is experiencing. Um, you also get something with, with depression often that's called anhedonia, um, literally meaning inability to feel. And it's a symptom where you just don't feel much. Um, a lot of times you're not feeling super sad. You're also not feeling happy at all anymore. Nothing really brings you joy that used to. It's just blank and blah. And so you're kind of just riding this, this middle of your mood and not feeling a whole lot of peaks or valleys. If you're going to feel anything, usually it's going to be more on the negative side, but certainly you're not feeling um, happy or excited or joyful or things like that. Um, sorry for the dog barking in the background if you heard that. <laughs> Your friend also might be experiencing agitation. Um, he, he said that I'm not depressed, I'm anxious. Well, when you're depressed, you can sometimes get agitated, which means you have like a buildup of, of um, 
like frustration. You can get wound up. You can feel like you're on edge. And a lot of that can feel somewhat similar to anxiety. So that may be what's happening with him, although it's also very common to experience both depression and anxiety at the same time. That, that wouldn't be uncommon. But absolutely, you can have that agitation that, that sets in with depression. And then overall, you know, he did endorse some sad mood, you know, feeling negative, feeling like, you know, um, low self-esteem, things are bad, um, and just feeling down in the dumps overall. And, and that definitely is common in depression. So as I said, a few things that are definitely, you know, suggesting that there, there may be something more serious than just feeling blue here and actually feeling somewhat depressed. Overall, one of the most important criteria that we use when diagnosing someone with a mental disorder like depression is to see if it's significantly impacting their life. So in this case, it definitely seems to be impacting your friend's schooling. Uh, you said that he hasn't been to classes in quite a while, doesn't do homework, and so there's definitely an effect there and an impact on you know, one of the most central, important parts of his life, which is school. Hearing your friends say and you agreeing that his brother needs therapy too also makes me wonder, you know, is there some turmoil at home and in the family environment that's contributing to this? And whenever we're considering someone's mental health, it helps to look at the whole system, the impact of kind of different spheres on their life. So on the smallest scale, we have like their immediate family unit, uh, people who live in the home together. On the broader scale, we have things like school, the neighborhood they live in, other involvements that they have. And then the bigger, broadest scale, we have things like society, the systems that we live in, stuff like that. And so you want to look at the impact of each of these things on a person when you're diagnosing them with something or when you're just trying to consider where they're at. You know, somebody who is showing a lot of depressive symptoms, but is actually having a really, really, really bad time at home. This might be a lot more reactional. It might be something that they're just trying to get through, but everything truly does suck. And that's not necessarily the sign, a sign that they have, you know, a mental disorder. They're just having a normal reaction to some really shitty circumstances. And so we want to consider all of these things. Um, basically, I'm trying to say that there are layers to this, and it might not be as simple as basically just recognizing depression and putting a stop to it. It's hard to heal in an environment that's making you sick. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do anything here. Anything is better than nothing. We want to pay attention to this. We want to try to help as best we can. But it's more complicated sometimes. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about what you can and should do. First off, I don't think that talking to the teacher um, is going to be the best idea, at least uh, as a first line uh, to try out. Teachers aren't always very adequately trained to deal with this sort of thing when it comes to mental health. So they may not handle the situation delicately. And as a result, your friend might see talking to the teacher as a you know, breach of your trust or a serious invasion of your privacy or of their privacy rather. Um, you know, sometimes teachers can <laughs> really bungle the whole situation. I can't believe I just said bungle, but yeah, they can mess it up. Like uh, calling the student up after class when other students are still in the room to sort of out them about the depression that they're having. Things like that. So you just want to be careful about it. Um, if there is a teacher who is, you know, specifically trained, maybe they have like a sticker on their door that it's a safe space or something like that. That's a different story. Um, but a lot of times the teacher isn't necessarily the best first line to, to try out. Um, if you have an on-campus school counselor, that might be a better place to turn. And you can be vague with them at first. You don't have to share anything that you don't want to share, but you can say that, you know, you have a friend that you're worried about because you think they might be depressed. You can explain what you explained to me and ask them for some guidance, ask them what you should do about it. And maybe they have some resources that, that you can pass along to your friend, some handouts or things like that, that you can give to your friend. Or maybe they have a nicer way as a school counselor to get your friend in there, to talk with them, to try to approach the situation in a constructive way to help out. So that's a great starting place if you have one available. Um, as a person, you can also educate yourself more about depression and you can guide your friend towards some resources that you might find. Luckily, nowadays, there are gazillions of awesome videos, blog posts, podcast episodes, all sorts of other media that explain what depression is and give some great coping tips. But overall, I want you to remember that, you know, this isn't your responsibility. Uh, you're not going to be able to fix him. And all of this is too much for a kid like you to just take on. So I know you care and you support him. And that's really what matters, that care and that support. Even if you don't think that you're getting through to him, continue to express your care and your concern for this friend of yours. I wouldn't treat them suddenly like they're damaged goods though. Like, oh, you know, you need to handle them with kid gloves. You, you need to be careful and treat them completely different than everybody else. I'm sure they still want to be considered to be, you know, a normal kid. So it's okay to have fun and be normal with them too. But when you see them showing these significant signs that seem depression-like to you, 
keep telling them that, hey, man, I'm concerned about you. Like, I'm worried. I think that you deserve to do better. You deserve to get some help. I don't like seeing you so sad. I don't like seeing you so upset. What can we do about this? Have you checked out that resource that I showed you? Have you talked to the school counselor? Whatever. Um, and your friend may also need to learn that there are different options when it comes to getting help. Uh, you said that, you know, his family can't afford it or he thinks his family can't afford it. A lot of times insurance can cover therapy. Um, sometimes there are also free options like local universities uh, might provide low cost or free therapy. I've done that before when I was training. Um, there are sliding scales. There's a whole lot of different options out there that that can help somebody to get, uh, you know, mental health treatment when they might not have a whole lot of money for it. And what I would say is that if it's safe for them to do so, uh, the best way to start this process would be to talk to their parents about it. Not you talk to their parents necessarily, but encourage them to talk to their parents about it. Um, it, it sometimes parents know that something's up, but they can't exactly point their finger as to what. So they see you know, his lack of trying in school, maybe acting out in certain ways, lack of effort. They may interpret that as sort of having a rebellious phase or just being a punk kid but they might be missing the point that your friend is actually depressed. And so if that can be brought up to them, they might be able to see things through a little bit of a different lens and, you know, treat their son differently in a way that's constructive and better and try to get him some help. Um, other starting points would potentially be, you know, family doctor, um, or, you know, if the parents have somebody that they work with in terms of like a therapist or something like that, anybody who is in a position where they are, you know, trained to deal with mental health and healthcare matters. But overall, keep caring. Don't try to force your friend to do anything. You know, give the suggestions gently. Be firm about the fact that you care, that you think that they should get some help, that they're not doing great, but that you're not going to push them into anything. You know, guide them toward resources. Remember that your role is just to show that you care in the best way that you can. So thank you for the question, and I'll have my fingers crossed for your friend. Hey, friends. The Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. Alrighty, friends, this episode is brought to you by Thrive Market. They're back again as a sponsor, and they continue to be a perfect sponsor for this period of time where we're not so sure about going into grocery stores in person all the time. Thrive Market gets you high-quality groceries delivered directly to your door, and they're also a great way to help families in need. Uh, Thrive Market is an online membership grocery store, and each paid membership provides one to a family in need, such as a low-income family, teacher, veteran, or first responder. You can shop by diet as well, which is great for those who may have medical or ethical considerations. So if you're vegan or you're on the low FODMAP diet or trying to do the paleo thing, whatever it is, you can shop by diet very easily using their uh, tools on the website. And that's very helpful because it's sometimes confusing to navigate those things on your own. Over the past few years, they've also really expanded and they have a lot of high quality products such as vitamins, bath and beauty products, and even pet supplies in addition to their food. As far as the food goes, you can get everything from snacks to baking supplies to ethically sourced meat and seafood. They even have wine. Uh, what my wife and I did is we used the credit that they gave us toward buying a box of meat. We are meat eaters, omnivores, if you will. And we got um, a box with uh, you know ground pork, chicken breasts, all sorts of things that we've been using during the summer as we barbecue and spend a lot of time at home cooking. So that's been really, really great. It came in a nice uh, package with, with dry ice and insulation. And then after we put the food away, the kids enjoyed using the dry ice with water to make smoke. So that was an extra uh, fun experience for them. And it killed a few hours or well, a few minutes of time during this, uh, this quarantine. Um, one of the coolest parts, though, about Thrive Market is the website. It's really well designed. They have a lot of different browsing and searching options. And they also provide a lot of extra information. So for instance, if you're looking at oils, butters, things like that, it'll give you tips for storage and how to use them. And the same goes for when you're looking at the meat. It tells you, you know, how they use sustainable practices, where the meat comes from, all of that. So they are very, very up upfront about that information and they try to guide you along the way. Shipping is free for orders over $49, which is a pretty low threshold in my opinion, and you can save 25 to 50% off traditional retail prices with your membership. So one last thing I'll say about the company in general is during this COVID pandemic, Thrive Market has really stepped up. And in addition to their normal membership matching that I explained at the beginning, they also been matching donations to the COVID-19 relief fund. And the CEOs donated their salaries to that relief fund as well. 
Um, their stock is currently up to date. They're shipping quickly again after some initial delays, but they're back to normal. And they were able to hire a lot more people for their fulfillment centers, which they assured me have been uh, done in a way that's very safe and clean and maintaining adequate social distancing and all of that good stuff. So they offer price matching and guarantee that you will make your membership fee back in savings. And if not, they credit your account for the difference at the end of the year, which is pretty cool. So great company, happy to support them. They're truly doing the best they can and they have a lot of great stuff on the website. It's a really good option for those of us who don't wanna go into stores very frequently right now. So if you wanna try Thrive Market and become a member risk-free, go to thrivemarket.com slash duff. D-U-F-F. Join today and you'll get up to $20 in shopping credit toward your first order. So that's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash Duff to start your free risk membership and get up to $20 toward your first order. Thrivemarket.com slash Duff. And back to the show. Okay, so question two, um, a little bit different than the last question. Hi, Robert. I was wondering if you could talk about how you deal with patients questioning their gender identity and how you help them navigate their transness. I'm 25 and up to up until a few months ago, it had never occurred to me that I might be trans. Increasingly, though, I felt a big disconnect from my period and my chest as if these phenomena and attributes were alien to me. Now, I've already experienced depersonalization in the past, especially when tired or depressed, but this time it seems to be only triggered by seeing my chest or my period. This discomfort isn't actually new. I wasn't already very keen on having breasts growing up, and it felt like an intrusion on my body. I did develop an eating disorder around age 13, which I'm happy to report I've finally beaten over the last year. Congratulations on that. And I know one of the things that drew me to severely restrict my food and over-exercise was that the skinnier I was, the less curves I had, and the more androgynous I looked. I never felt male, though, and that's why it took me so long to question my gender. Over the past few years, but especially the past year, I've been increasingly aware of there being people who identified as non-binary. At first, I didn't think it had anything to do with me, as it seemed quite obscure and multifaceted, obviously since non-binary people are all different, all a different expression of what it means to be neither male or female. It's also something I found very little information on, whether occurrences of non-binary people in history or criteria to qualify as non-binary. There are personal accounts of people on the internet, which is invaluable to me, but I guess I was looking for objective sources and reports. More than anything, I would like to know if I'm moving in the right direction and I don't appropriate an identity that isn't mine to take. As a bisexual, I'm pretty open to gender being fluid and don't feel too scared at the thought of rethinking how I identify. I'm also aware that whether I want to change my pronouns and the name I go by, even just temporarily, it's okay because it's just another way of making myself more comfortable. I was just wondering if you had any advice on how to navigate this questioning your gender identity. Um, and then there's a little bit more just saying thanks and stuff like that. So really good question. A little bit long there. Um, hopefully uh, we can dig into it a bit. I, I really appreciate you trusting me with this question. Um, you know, I will say that I'm not fully equipped to give you a fully informed opinion about this, right? But I will give you some thoughts and try to point to you in the right direction. I'm not trans or non-binary. I don't belong necessarily to the LGBTQ plus community. Although I have friends, family who are in the community, you know, I, I have a queer wife, um, close trans friends. I, I work with a lot of people who have, have, uh, you know, passed through my clinical work and work as stuff the psych that identify as trans. So obviously I have some comfort and familiarity with the topic, with the ideas, with, you know, people who identify as such, but it's not my experience. I don't have that lived experience. So please take what I say with a grain of salt. I do want to say though, that it's not too late for you to realize that you are trans or non-binary. There are so many factors at play and it's definitely common for people to realize this and even make a transition later on in life. It's also very common for someone's understanding of their gender identity to shift over time. For instance, pe people may, you know, um, know for sure that they don't identify with their assigned sex, but beyond that, they're unsure of, of what their gender identity would be if, if they're trans, non-binary, etc., and their feelings toward that may shift over time. A lot of the experiences that you talked about, um, like developing an eating disorder so that you wouldn't have as strong of curves physically, um, feeling depersonalization when confronted with biological things such as your period, these are very common and familiar stories to people that experience gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is basically what we call that discomfort or distress that's caused by a conflict between you know, the gender that someone has been assigned or that's been assigned to them and the one that they experience subjectively, the one that they identify with. 
So for example, a person that is born with female anatomy and has been told that they're a girl throughout their life may experience significant gender dysphoria if their identified gender is in fact male, if they know that they're a male. So this person may understand that they are a man, but feel totally trapped in a woman's body, which is understandably not a pleasant experience. Um, often people feel significant dysphoria when they're confronted with reminders of this conflict. So things like puberty, you know, the development of those secondary sexual characteristics like breasts that can really throw someone into dysphoria. Also body hair, um, as you mentioned, a period, those, the, these things can all be triggers of that dysphoria. And it presents differently for everyone. For some people, it's, you know, expressed as just significant depression, feeling really down and hopeless. Um, I know someone that would become very depressed and even suicidal when feeling a lot of dysphoria. And for this person, her dysphoria was often connected to facial hair uh, because that was something that was not in line with her, with her gender identity. And feelings of depersonalization are very common, and they actually make a lot of sense when you think about it in terms of uh, gender dysphoria. So depersonalization is the feeling of being disconnected from your body. It often feels like you're an observer or you're operating on autopilot. You're not really totally in control. You're just letting it do its own thing, and you're sort of along for the ride as this disconnected observer. And if you feel at war with the body that you live in, if you feel like you're housed in a body that wasn't made for the person you are, being disconnected can be a coping mechanism, right? It's not necessarily the solution, but it's something that temporarily your brain does to give you a little bit of relief from feeling the sting of that, that war that's going on in your body all the time. So all this is to say that your experience is totally normal. I just want to validate that. And it's, it's normal for what you're going through. You don't need to feel weird or odd about it. You don't need to question yourself about it. Um, you know, this is, this is the cards that you've, these are the cards that you've been drawn and the way that you've experienced these things is very normal for that. Obviously you feel a little tentative because you're still learning about your own gender identity. You're aware that, you know, um, you don't want to claim an identity that doesn't belong to you. And I could certainly respect that. I think one of the best things that you can do, and you've hinted at some of this, but continue to get perspective from people that have been there. Talk to trans people, talk to non-binary people, talk to people that get it. Because from my lived experience, I can't give you that perspective. Um, you know, I'm a predominantly hetero, cisgender, white dude. I can't give you a whole lot in terms of, you know, my own experiences to, to compare. Um, but there are great organizations out there, right? We have like the Trevor Project and other organizations that are great. They have resources, they have ways to connect people. And with the internet now, there are a lot of resources and communities that you can find and connect to other people who can give you advice from their perspective. So I would say collect these perspectives, talk with these people, see what their lived experience of going through similar things is like, and share what you're going through with them to see what they have to say about it. You know, no one of these people are going to have the master answer for you, but it's through collecting these, these thoughts and these opinions and these experiences that you can sort of put the pieces together in your own brain. If you have a support network in your personal life, it may be important to engage with them too. Now, that said, you don't have to out yourself to everyone. You don't have to tell people, you know, exactly what you're going through and be completely open about it because sometimes that's not safe. Sometimes that's not comfortable and you may not be ready for that. Um, but it does make such a huge difference when you have someone that you can trust and that you can confide in. Even if it's only one person, if you have that, that sort of rock that you can give these thoughts to and you know they're going to treat them with care and respect, that makes a really big difference in terms of mental health outcomes. So if you have the ability to do so, do that. Also, if you have the ability to do so, find a good therapist. You know, find one that focuses on LGBTQ issues in particular. Now, this is this can sometimes be a challenge, like if your local area does not have a lot of people who specialize in this that you can work with, this might be a good opportunity to try out some online therapy. Um, there are apps, obviously, I've, I've had BetterHelp as a sponsor here before, Talkspace, Seven Cups, places like that, um, and they do have people that focus on LGBTQ issues in there, but I would also suggest having a look to see if maybe you can find a private online therapist. I have a video all about this, so if you go to YouTube and search um, how to find a private online therapist, you'll find my video or I'll link it in the show notes as well. Just go to deafthesych.com slash episode 210 and you'll be able to find it there. But uh, you know, you can find any therapist in the state that you reside in and work with them online legally. 
So if there's somebody within your state that is a superstar and a great person that you could work with for issues related to being trans, non-binary, et cetera, then maybe you could work with them remotely, even if they're not anywhere close to your local area. And that could be a good resource for you. But having a therapist who can actually be empathetic and can support you while you're navigating these very complex and confusing, confusing issues could be very beneficial. Um, I wish that I could give you more direct advice as to whether you're moving in the right direction. I'm, I'm very hesitant to point you toward anything that's a formal resource because, you know, being non-binary is not a disorder. It's not like, you know, you check off, check off enough, enough boxes in the DSM and you qualify for that disorder. It's not a disorder. And these terms are things that I think are, are very rightfully are come, they come out of the communities that they're impacting, the, the communities that, um, that own these labels. They, they develop these labels, they own these labels, and they dictate what it means to be such and such, right? Whether that's non-binary, trans, et cetera. So I wouldn't want to point you towards something that's too clinical and, um, you know, sort of fake and not rooted in the actual experience. That's why I'm encouraging you to reach out to individuals and even, you know, like I said, therapists, organizations like the Trevor Project, um, organizations that actually are rooted in the experience of being trans or non-binary. So I wish I can give you a better direct, you know, sort of um, answer here, but that's not really for me to say. This is your own identity that you're discovering. I think the best course is to be gentle with yourself though, for having these hard and confusing feelings and, you know, continue gathering these experiences that you can learn from, find support from people that understand. And hopefully over time, the support and the information will bolster the self-discovery that you're doing all the way through. And you can take whatever time you need. This is your life we're talking about here. There's no deadline for figuring this out. I know it can feel intense. And especially when you're having dysphoria, you may want to make some decisions simply to reduce that dysphoria. And that's understandable. And that's your right to do if there's anything that you feel like you could do to help with that. But don't feel guilty because you're not sure yet or you're not there yet. This is your journey and it's going to take its own path. But um, there's a lot of people out there who are ready and willing to support you in that. So thank you for the really good question. Again, sorry that I couldn't give you a more direct answer. And I probably rambled a little bit during this one. My brain is fried today. It's hot as balls outside. And, uh, you know, we're all just doing the best that we can here. Thank you for listening very much, everybody. That is the end of the episode. This has been episode 210 of the Hardcore Self-Help uh, Podcast. If you have questions or topics, any suggestions for me, shoot them over to duffthepsych at gmail.com. And I will see you for the next episode. Bye.